morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I have as my guest today, Ashley Michelle Fowler. Ashley Michelle, how are you? I am so well and so delighted to be with you this morning. I am so excited to have you here. Last time I saw you was in New York City and we had breakfast together and I talked to you about being on my show and that was quite a while ago, but here we are. Finally. Entering, in, entering into the into the autumn and I finally have captured you for my show. So um, let me tell my viewers a little bit. It's a long bio. You've done a lot in your very short years about Ashley Michelle Fowler. She is an independent consultant and hospital administrator with over 15 years of experience and education in topics of diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, and intercultural communication. She holds a master's of education in interdisciplinary studies and a bachelor of science in public communication with a minor in community and international development, both from the University of Vermont. Ashley Michelle currently serves as the administrative program manager in the Patricia S. Levinson Center for Multicultural and Community Affairs in the Office for Diversity and Inclusion in the Mount Sinai Health System in New York, and is a PhD student at Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon, studying barriers in the healthcare system for Black men in the United States. Ashley Michelle is a self-identified nerd with a deep interest in pop culture, trivia, technology, football, karaoke, and she is a stand-up comedian. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, girlfriend. That that lady sounds a lot cooler than me. <laughs> <laughs> that is you. And I am so thrilled to have you on my show, Ashley Michelle. It's a pleasure. So, um, so let's start at the beginning. Let's just start start where we should where we should always start. And that is the beginning. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about your childhood growing up. Yeah. So I actually grew up in the Bronx, New York, in a neighborhood called Pelham Bay. And I grew up in a really Irish Italian neighborhood and it was, you know, my father's Irish and Italian. So there was a lot of that culture really present. And, um, you know, I grew up the oldest of four children and it was a really lovely life. Like we grew up in poverty, but I, I would say we weren't always hyper aware of that because our parents did a really good job of trying to give us meaningful experiences and kind of uh, exposing us to the world around us. And as someone who really loved reading, I learned to read when I was two years old. And so I found my escapes and my adventuring in books. And my mother would take us to the library every week and we could check out a maximum of 10 books each. And so I did that. And I read about places like ancient Egypt and, uh, you know, places around the country and Europe. And I just, I dreamt all these big dreams and it was lovely. Did you have siblings? Yeah. So I have two younger sisters and a younger brother, and I also have an older half sister. So it was a very full house. And, um, you know, like I said, my father's Irish and Italian, my mother's Filipina and French Canadian. So we always joke that we were the United Nations in our house. So, um, that's fascinating. And so did you get a lot of culture injected by living um, in New York? Um, yeah. yeah. You know, New York city is just like, <laughs> It, it's international culture in, in a daily dose, you know? So, you know, we would go to different businesses around town and each were owned by folks of different ethnicities and you hear different languages being spoken and you have different types of folks in your, in your school. And, you know, so it was just like, it was a really beautiful thing. And actually my father worked in the city. So in Manhattan and he would commute in every day and he would take us into the city sometimes for just like more exposure. And one of the areas that he was really plugged into was the unhoused community. And so he just really got to know the folks that were in the neighborhood around his, his workplaces. And, um, and he really took time to see them, to understand their humanity, to know their names and one of the kind of most meaningful experiences we had was, um, again, we didn't have a lot of money, but my parents always made sure that there was an abundant piece during Thanksgiving. And so much so that after the six of us ate, there were leftovers. And I remember my father would get to go containers 
and fill them up with our leftovers. And we would then drive into the city and drop them off to these different unhoused folks that he had gotten to know. And so it was just a very developmental experience for me to not only see the unhoused folks as humans and, and complex beings, but to kind of have that, that value of service instilled in me at such a young age. Well, I was going to ask you how you had the greatest impact on your extraordinary journey in life. Um, would it have been your father? I would say, you know, certainly both of my parents, they were, even though neither of them had graduated from college, they had their high school diplomas and they were really passionate about education. And so they made sure that our house was filled with reading and learning and, and that we were committed to our schoolwork. And then my grandmother, so my mother's mother was like my best friend and she was so special and we had the most brilliant connection and uh, she just loved on me so hard and prayed over my life every single day. And, uh, you know, we, we lost her a few years ago, but she was someone who I could spend hours with on the phone and she just, you know, she was a French Canadian immigrant who was schooled in Cuba and then moved to the U.S. in her teens and taught herself English by watching television, met my Filipino grandfather, got married, raised a family of six, lost my grandfather when she was in her 40s, and then continued to raise her kids and then be a loving grandmother. So I I was very blessed that I had a lot of folks in my corner. And I would say also my teachers were really amazing. Like I just have very supportive educators who always helped me believe that I could achieve things that wouldn't seem statistically possible given my circumstances. Outstanding. Well, that says so much about, about your life and about your extraordinary, um, Uh, accomplishments, Ashley, Michelle. So as I was doing research on you, I came across something that really interests me. Talk to me about the Good Men Project. I believe Mm -hmm. that you're involved in. Talk talk to us about that. Yeah. So in 2015, there was an international conference on masculinities that was held in New York City. And I was able to attend and participate and just learn from folks who were doing work on supporting boys and men um, imagining and achieving healthy identity development around masculinities, because we know that there's so many toxic messages and toxic expectations for men in this culture, which promote a culture of misogyny and patriarchy. And so for me, I came into masculinities work as a really hardcore intersectional feminist thinking about how could we support boys and men showing up as their authentic selves to mitigate the issues that women and folks of other genders are experiencing because of the harmful impacts of the patriarchy and misogyny. And so while I was at the International Conference on Masculinities, I met some folks, including the editor and some writers who are affiliated with the Good Men Project, which is an international um, blog and resource for folks to kind of have a healthy discourse on what masculinities could look like. And it was at that conference and meeting these folks that I was encouraged to write for the blog myself. And I was so honored that I was able to write several pieces, talk about my lived experiences and share some insights on how we could really support men being their full, complex, beautiful, wholesome selves. So where do my, where do my viewers find the podcast or the website? Where, where would they find it? Yeah. So um, if folks uh, search for the Good Men Project, Mm -hmm. there's, um, there's a lot on that website. It's really good. And then um, if you look for the Good Men Project and then search my name, Ashley Michelle Fowler, you can see the pieces that I've authored and they're really wonderful. Outstanding. Um, thank you for your work in that. Because yeah, absolutely. That, that, you know, we have an impact on men and we can help them to evolve and, and be more enlightened, right? Yes. Indeed. And, you know, I, I feel really blessed because I know so many of the men in your family and, you know, you, you've done just done incredible work of creating an environment that fosters that. And so I know it's possible. And I know that when women 
come together in support of our boys and men. And we really think about how to allow them to express their fullness, you know, their vulnerabilities, their softness, that everyone benefits from that. Absolutely. So now you're, Ashley, Michelle, you're a stand-up comedian. I and am. Travel, and you travel all over the United States and perform. Talk to us about how you got into comedy and a little bit about this side of you. Yeah, it's funny because I had been a longtime fan of comedy, but never imagined myself in that space. I've always been kind of more in the straight and narrow, very serious. But I think there's always been this creative and artsy side to me that I just didn't cultivate because I didn't see it as valuable. And I think growing up poor, I was just trying to figure out how do I get out of poverty? So I I played it more safe. And what I realized was that I really needed more creative outlets. And so during lockdown, I was like, you know what? I don't have a lot of excuses. Uh, I've got a lot more time than I ever have. So let me, you know, just stretch this muscle and see what could be. And so I um, started taking workshops with the Vermont Comedy Club, actually. And at the time I had been living in Vermont for about 16 years. And so I, I'd been a huge supporter and fan of the Vermont Comedy Club, but had never really engaged in their work. And so during the lockdown, I started taking workshops and I was a terrible joke writer. There was way too much, you know, I was like basically telling stories. I should have been doing the moth. But thankfully, the educators there were so patient with me and shout out to Nathan and Natalie for the good work they're doing at the Vermont Comedy Club. And uh, and eventually I got to a point where folks were like, "Okay, like you're actually writing jokes now. Let's like see how this develops. So when lockdown ended and we were finally able to go out in the world and uh, and reassociate with humanity, I started getting gigs in person and um and, you know, I was just thinking if I'm bad at this, it'll be a fun thing to say I did. But, you know, fortunately, I'm more good than bad. And folks started paying me to do this. And then as I started traveling, I would tap into my network. And yeah, I've performed in uh, probably almost a dozen states at this point. And I've just had a really fun time having this outlet for my artsy side and just being able to connect with audiences and to find the humor and the challenging parts of life. Well, do you have a website? Yeah, um, I'm actually in the middle of the build out right now, but um, until the website is launched, we're going to just direct folks to find me on YouTube or Instagram, Facebook. And um, I definitely try to keep up to date on my socials about when the next gigs are coming up. And certainly if anyone's listening and excited to promote comedy, uh, you know, I'm just always excited to travel, meet people across the country and just connect with audiences. I really love it. So when will we see when will we see you perform in Vermont? You know, it's funny. I Vermont's basically my second home state. I spent so much of my adult life there. And I I didn't open mic there years ago, but I have yet to do a full on show. Well, come on. So I'm working on it and we are we're gonna get this booked. But Vermonters, yeah. if you're listening, I will come to your bars, your clubs, your well, laundromats, think, think, wherever you want me to sling jokes, I will be there. I think we I think I think we should book the Main Street Landing black box. I can't and, and wait. Get, and get you in the black box and then just advertise it. And you have such a huge following in Vermont. And the black yes. is such a great venue for that, you know. So I, I love Main I, Street Landing. I what think, a gift. <laughs> and I think there's a conversation you need to have with Mariah. So I can't wait. We get, we get on that girlfriend. Yes, so I'm coming for you, Vermont. <laughs> that, that, yes, you are. I understand that you came to Vermont because you uh, you went to UVM. That's right. So I was in New York and had been applying to colleges my senior year. And I actually, you know, because I was a nerdy kid and, you know, did well in school, I knew Vermont was north of me and I knew that Montpelier was the capital, but I'd never been I didn't know about Ben and Jerry's. I didn't know about the dairy industry. I didn't know about the great cheese. I'd never had real maple syrup in my life, but the university of Vermont actually contacted me and asked me to apply. And so I was like, Oh, I'll just add it to my list of colleges I'm applying to. And then uh, my family and I actually took a tour 
and it was so lovely. And then, you know, everything kind of coalesced for it to be the top school. And so I ultimately wound up attending UVM and I got hooked. I stayed after I graduated, I worked, um, I got my master's and I wound up living in Vermont for over 16 years. So up until a few years ago, when I moved back to New York, I had spent my entire adult life in Vermont and it was such a beautiful about gift. That. Talk about some of the great work because you and I met, uh, we served together on the Vermont Commission on Women and we met, I'm not sure if it was at Mercy Connection or where, but talk about uh, what you did while you were in Vermont because you made a huge impact on the state in those in those simple and 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 short 16 years. Talk about that. It was, it was mutual. Vermont has left an indelible imprint on me. And so, you know, I just feel really thankful that I had those years and, you know, I started by working in higher education. Most of my career has been, been spent in student affairs and just working to support student development and help them on their own journeys. Because for me, going to college was such a critical time. Again, neither of my parents had gone to college. And so, I was learning the ropes as I went and that made me passionate to give back and to support college students on their own journeys and help demystify some of these things that are just scary and weird and big and different about school. And so I spent a number of years working at the university of Vermont in various student affairs capacities. I ultimately taught at the community college of Vermont. I worked at Champlain college um, again, in the student affairs space. And then I also had this great gift of being able to work in the nonprofit educational space at Mercy Connections, which met. is an incredible educational nonprofit in Burlington. I got to meet wonderful, beautiful folks like Melinda. And um, through that work, also got to work with the Vermont Commission on Women and support adult learners who weren't necessarily supported or flourishing in other traditional educational environments. And so being able to do that work was such my heart's work and so lovely. And it just gave me all kinds of incredible skills and helped me expand my network out even further. So I love Vermont. I am a huge fan of maple syrup. It's all I eat with my pancakes and waffles. Um, I became really outdoorsy there. I didn't really have a lot of access to the outdoors in New York, but you know, I'm proud to say I've hiked all the big peaks in Vermont and, you know, I've camped and had such incredible experiences. And frankly, it made me bold enough to go other places. And so one summer I spent interning in Wyoming and I did some whitewater rafting and backpacking and all kinds of kooky things. So my time in Vermont really transformed me in the most beautiful ways. Well, I think you transformed Vermont. I mean, in 16 years and you were so young. And you just you just talk about climbing that ladder and crashing through the glass ceiling. So thank you for your service to Vermont. So what what inspired you to leave? What what was the inspiration for you to head back down to your hometown of New York? Yeah, well, um, during the pandemic, the two things that I realized were missing in my world were more creative outlets, which is where the comedy came in, and then scholarship and academia. Because although I was working out of college at the time, I felt like I needed more intellectual discourse and I wanted to be a part of the work that was informing the practice. And so I actually applied to graduate school during um, the initial part of the pandemic. And so I started my, my PhD program in the fall of 2020. And through that program, I met a wonderful colleague and friend who worked at the Mount Sinai Health System. And she saw the job opportunity come up in the Center for Multicultural and Community Affairs and thought that I would be an incredible candidate. And this was an excellent opportunity of people seeing things in you that you didn't necessarily see in yourself. Because when I re read the job description, I thought, wow, this sounds like a really cool job. But like a lot of women do, I questioned, was I qualified? Was I ready? Would they take me seriously? And I had all this self-doubt but I had this friend and cohort mate who really championed me. So she encouraged me to apply and I put my application in and then she put me in touch with the hiring manager and everything moved so quickly. And so I remember I sent in my resume on a Wednesday. 
I was interviewing for the position on a Friday, on that Friday, the following week, I had a second interview and the following week after that, I was offered the job. And so during lockdown, when everybody's kind of isolated, I had to decide within a couple of weeks, if I was going to pick up my life of 16 years, move it back to the city during the pandemic, when New York city was actually the epicenter of what was going on and work for this health system. And I prayed about it. I contemplated it. I asked folks for advice, but I think ultimately the ability to do the work that Vermont had trained me to do and cultivated in me on a larger scale in the largest private healthcare system in New York was really inspiring. And it was a challenge that I really rose to because I thought I'm having a beautiful and good impact in Vermont, but I didn't want to keep it isolated in Vermont. And so with a lot of sadness and a lot of uh, torn feelings, I launched into this world where I could do it on a larger scale. The Mount Sinai Health System has over 43,000 employees and then graduate medical nursing students and all the patients we serve. So I just saw that the ability to do this work in such a seismic way was going to be really rewarding. And honestly, I completely credit my time in Vermont and the people I met and those who coached and championed me that allowed me to even dream these dreams. I mean, but look at that. I mean, you are the administrative program manager in the Patricia S. Levinson Center for Multicultural and Community Affairs in the Office for Diversity and Inclusion in the Mount Sinai Health System in New York. That's huge. That's huge. Yeah. So are you happy to be back closer to your family? I am, you know, I, I miss Vermont so much. And I think for me, one of the things that is always important to sustain me is travel. And I travel a lot. I love traveling. And so, you know, when New York gets overwhelming or, you know, just exhausting, I try to pull away to the countryside. So whether that's Vermont or somewhere in upstate New York or, you know, just a more rural area, I, I love the ability to be able to do that with ease. And New York is great because it's a wonderful travel hub. So I can take Amtrak's, buses, Metro North, the, the planes. We have three major airports, you know. So, so I feel like I took the best of Vermont with me. And I live within a 10-minute walk to Central Park. And so there are days when I get lost in that park and I forget that I'm even in a city. Or That's I walk outstanding. to I the East it. River and I just like sit by the water and I daydream of Lake Champlain. So <laughs> it's been hard, but also beautiful. Well, now we have a train out of Penn Station that comes exactly. right to Burlington. Yeah, so you can take the train right to Burlington. Give me a call. And what a beautiful ride that is. It is. It's right up the Hudson. It's gorgeous. So let's talk a little bit about, you are a woman of very strong faith. Yes. I admire you in that. Do you have faith in humanity to right the ship that we're on right now? It's huh. a good question. I, I think that my faith, faith reminds me that there's something bigger than humanity and bigger than all of us, which that's really where I rooted in is that even when we as humans miss the mark, that there's a protective guiding force that's going to keep us kind of right correcting, right, uh, you know, correcting the course. But I, I also do believe that there, I would say my belief is that most humans are waking up trying to add good to the world, trying to do their best. And there's always bad actors. And I think that sometimes we try and we're misguided and we miss the mark. But I think that there is a lot of genuine desire for goodness, for joy, for um, improvement. And I think that we just need to keep finding our ways to come together because there's, there's, there's so much trying to divide us, to distract us, to keep us infighting. And I think when we start seeing our commonalities, our threads, our, our shared human, you know, humanity, that's when we do our best. And so I don't think I have faith in humanity as a whole to do the right thing and to get us to where we need to go. But I do think that there are a lot of people who are trying to keep the focus there. Well, you know, that sort of segues into my next question. Um, so what what wisdom and advice would you give to our youth on how to navigate their world with the climate crisis, attacks on our democracy, women's reproductive freedoms, 
being eliminated are economic inequality and racial, ethnic, and Semitic racism, just to name a few of their many challenges for our children, for our kids. Yeah. Growing up, I don't know if you have you you have youngsters that you uh, you know, nieces and nephews, but you must oh, yeah. you must be a mentor to a lot of young people. What what are your words of wisdom? What do you tell them about the world that they're growing up in? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things I always try to remember is if we look back at history, young people have always spearheaded the most significant change and civil rights movements and activism in our world. So I actually, I I tend to try to get adults <laughs> to listen to young people because I think that we we often think we know what we're doing and we forget that it was in our youth that we were able to make the changes. So I, I, I almost kind of just defer to the young people to say like, what should we be doing? What do you all see as the challenges? But I think that the, you know, the advice and the insights that come from age is that we can teach young people how to keep their passion and fire in sustainable ways so that they're not burning out and they're not becoming cynical and jaded because that's so easy to do. And I think sometimes when we're not strategic with our passion, we don't have the largest impact that we desire. And so I, I always try to work with the students I work with, with my niece and my nephews, with anyone who I can support in their own developmental journey is to study the expertise from those who have come before us and to understand that while we have these hero figures and people like Rosa Parks and Susan B. Anthony and, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., right? Like we have these heroes, but we don't always get taught the entire systems that were behind them and the nameless people that allowed them to flourish. And so sometimes young people try to be martyrs and they try to do it all themselves. And I say, no, like we need to come together. We need to have a lot of strategy and we need to be really thoughtful and intentional about how we pursue what we're doing. So I say, let the young people tell us what the problems are and how we should solve them. And let's be there to support them, not burning out and being able to do it in a measured way so that their impact isn't lost. Do you, do you think, do you believe the kid that, that kids are getting much more engaged now than, 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 than they were maybe six years ago, but that they're getting more engaged? And I mean, cause yeah. I, between you, I think 60 million people, old people have passed on and now there's a whole new generation of like 45 million new new, new youngsters who are coming yes. to voting age. And I think we're seeing a little bit of a shift, uh, in embracing, you know, all the sort of progressive rights that, um, they're, they're not putting up with the, you know, the racism and the, you know, the kind of the ugliness that, uh, that I think they've been seeing. Yeah. And they're I think, quite, you know, the status quo is being challenged in a beautiful way, but, you know, I also, I would say young people have always been the most engaged and the biggest thought leaders. But I think what's interesting about today's landscape is that there's so many different ways for them to show up. So, you know, they're having easy ways to connect with each other across time zones, across continents, right? And so information is coming much easier and much faster which in some ways is a drawback because there's a lot of misinformation. And then we have some of the challenges with AI and, um, you know, just trying to discern think, what's real and what's fake. <laughs> I think it's great. And I have a yeah. really hard time with, with people my age, you know, just disparaging the social media. I mean, the, these kids are so intellectual and so aware. Yes. And when I look at a 13 year old, today and when I was 13 and how uneducated and unaware I was of anything. And these kids, they're on top of it all. It's amazing. Yes. And I look at your grandbabies and this is where I have hope. Like when people tell me like that things are hopeless, it's, this is why I work with college students and now medical and graduate students. It's why I look to the young people in my world because they give me hope. Like, look, I mean, I, just this very special shout out to Rowan Riggs. Like 
what a brilliant mind thinker artist like the the discernment and the wisdom that Rowan puts out into the world like that alone gives me hope you know so I just think and and you know your grand girls are just phenomenal brilliant empowered gorgeous young women I like I think we need to do less talking at young people and more listening to them. Absolutely. Bravo to you. Bravo to you. Well, you know, Ashley, we're coming to the end of my show. And I just want to tell you that you are an amazingly gifted and accomplished woman and a dear, dear friend. And I hope I get to see you up in Vermont soon sharing your comedic talents. And I think we need to get on that really soon. Yes, I can't Until wait. The spring or whatever. When the weather's better and get that in the books. Yes. You can have everybody come down to the black box. All of your followers. There's hundreds of people who have followed your career and have have just so adored and loved you. And I think it would be great to get you back up here to do a to do one of your shows. Oh yeah. And you know, I will say as much as I love Vermont, there's a lot of humor to be had in some of the quirkiness of it. So Absolutely. we'll have a good laugh together. It'll be a good time. <laughs> well, let, me, let me help you put, make that happen. My darling. I would love that. And to, and to my viewers, thank you for being with uh, Ashley, Michelle Fowler and myself today. I am just so delighted to finally have this interview with you. And, and I wish you all a beautiful day. It's a sunny, sunny September day in Vermont. And I wish you a beautiful day and get out there and enjoy it. And I will see you very soon. Thank you for Take being here. Bye-bye, my darling. Bye-bye.